Welcome to the Advanced Freelancing Podcast. Every week, you'll hear strategies for building your online service-based business your way. And now, here's your host, veteran freelancer, author, and TEDx speaker, Laura Briggs. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Advanced Freelancing Podcast. As you know, I love talking with other freelancers who have been doing this for a while, and I feel like those people are some of the most powerful resources you can turn to either when you're getting started or when you're getting ready to scale because we've been there. We've seen lots of things. We've probably made lots of mistakes that we can advise you not to make as you are growing your own business. And so I'm very excited today to have my guest, Ruth, here with me. Ruth, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about you and how you got into freelancing. Oh, gosh. This goes back a long, long time. I'm not going to say quite how long. I got into freelancing back in high school when I got turned down for the school literary magazine. So Mm -hmm. I did two things. I started my own with some friends, and I got in touch with the local weekly newspaper and pitched them on having me write for pay. Not very much, but for pay, a column about things going on at the high school. So that goes way back to age 17, 16, something like that. When I started taking it very seriously is when I was in St. Louis and ended up in one of these classic I quit, you're fired situations (laughs) and a freelance job that I had taken on mostly as a favor to a colleague really saved my bacon, so to speak, and gave me some income while I was job hunting. Mm -hmm. And then I took it up another notch, Laura, when I went from St. Louis to D.C. for an assistant editor's position on a magazine. But I'm a writer first and foremost. So I found out about a group, a local or regional writers group there, and used its job service to find a few freelance writing assignments. Several of those turned into ongoing projects where I did the one first thing that somebody had listed, and instead of waiting for them to call me, came up with new story ideas for them and ended up with quite a few ongoing projects. Mm -hmm. I reached a point with my second D.C. full-time job, which was communications manager for a business trade association, where I was just really burned out with dragging out to the office every day and sitting there for eight hours a day where there wasn't always eight hours worth of work to do and meetings and all the usual office stuff. Converted that to a freelance contract in, oh, around 84. And I've been freelancing full time ever since. Oh, that's awesome. So (laughs) you were probably more intentional about jumping into freelance. I mean, you kind of, maybe you didn't even realize you were pursuing it with that very first um, role that you had, uh, but that kind of led you down uh, a long path. And so what have you seen are the biggest changes in freelancing from when you started to where we're at today? I think the biggest change that we're looking at now is the proliferation of so-called job service or job finding resources like Fiverr and Mm -hmm. Upwork and whatever they're calling themselves now, as well as a lot of ones that are trying to launch. I, Mm -hmm. several of my colleagues and I just got a pitch this past week from somebody who, if we've if we've understood their not well written message, <laughs> is trying to start a network for freelance editors. The problem with those is, yes, on the one hand, you can get work from them, whether you're a writer, editor, proofreader, and also all kinds of non communications freelance gigs. But you're not going to make much money. Mm -hmm. You don't interact for the most part with the people whose work you're working on. And they're driving down what the rest of us can sometimes charge for professional level work Mm -hmm. by experienced, trained, and skilled freelancers. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest landscape change. The other, yeah, and the, the other might be that There have always been people who wanted to freelance Mm -hmm. in any number of areas. 
I think we're seeing a lot more people with that interest. We're certainly seeing students who want to freelance the minute they're done with school, maybe while they're still in school, and who never want to have a full-time in-house job. Mm-hmm. That that bothers me a little bit because I think there are things you learn from working in-house about dealing with people and networking mm-hmm. and skills mm-hmm. that you miss out on if you never do that, even for just a year or two. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. I, I think too, like the issue with job boards and all of the new ones that are coming out. Well, like, first of all, all the new ones that come out, uh, we all get those pitches, don't we? And they always want you to check it out or they want you to review it or share it with your audience. And the problem is that they're trying to build a two-sided market and starting any business is hard, but no freelancer wants to join your platform if you don't have clients and no client wants to join your platform if you don't have freelancers. And so you have to attract two different audiences with different needs and they need to be there in big enough numbers for the other side to want to come along. And I think the other challenge for freelancers with that is even when we maybe don't want to rely on those job boards or even sign up for them and scan them quickly, some of our clients do go there first, right? Some of my clients don't know any better than to type in hire a freelance writer or hire a freelancer into Google and they get the ad for Upwork immediately. You know, they get pushed there or they just know of Upwork because it's been around so long. And so it is hard to sort of balance that. Um, but I definitely think you're right. There, there seems to be more and more and more, few of them really succeed, right? If, if, right. At least in my opinion, right. like there's a handful of really prominent ones. Most of the ones that, uh, are, have been around for a while. It's just, they have that name recognition and they have that yeah. two-sided market built up. So you've been freelancing for quite a while. I've been freelancing for almost 10 years. And I like the fact that you brought up this idea of some people are leaving uh, college or maybe after their very first job, they're thinking, this isn't for me. I want to go freelance. Sometimes that can be a person who will do really well at freelancing and they're just suited for it. And they're seeing the early signs and saying, I'm entrepreneurial, I'm deadline driven, I'm organized. I have the base skill set to offer my services. Sometimes, though, I feel like it attracts people who feel like it's a get-rich-quick scheme or it's yes. easy. And so today our big, yeah. to- our big topic is why really go freelance and why not? So where do, you think it, where do you think we should start as far as what are the biggest reasons someone really should consider going freelance? When is it a good fit for somebody? What are the questions they should be asking to verify, hey, this is well-suited to me? I would say the moment to go freelance is if you've developed some experience, you've had some kind of training, you've got something to show for your abilities, either some published articles with your name on them, your byline, or some finished work in, and I'll stick to the editorial field, but Mm -hmm. some finished work as an editor or proofreader, an indexer, a photographer, whatever, Mm -hmm. where you can prove to people that, you do have something to offer that other people have valued, whether it's in-house or freelance. Mm -hmm. So you have something as a starting point. Mm -hmm. You also have some experience in the workplace that you can use for setting your rates or fees. Mm -hmm. Because with some clients, they'll say, here's what we pay. With other clients, they'll say, oh, we've never used a freelancer before. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, we need a new freelancer what do you charge? And yes. Figuring out rates, I think, is historically and will continue to be the biggest. The, the two biggest challenges are setting your rates mm-hmm. and finding work. Yeah. Yeah. And I- the work, you know, work that meets the rate that you either <laughs> deserve or think you deserve. So when you're at that point, when you're maybe totally burned out with where you are, you're tired of whatever you're covering. If you've already got some kind of a writing job, for instance, if you dread going to the office or doing whatever it is that you usually do. Mm -hmm. And then again, that you have something to use to convince me that it's worth hiring you. Yes. And that's, that's a big one. I think the work sample can be bigger than any 
experience that you've had in some cases, I think it's probably easier with writing and with things like graphic design where yeah. clients really care about the skill and the talent. And so they're willing to say, oh, you're new, but you're talented or, oh, you haven't been freelancing long, but I like your style. Right. And so yeah. that can get over some of those other hurdles of how hard it is to get hired when you're first getting started. So I see a lot of freelancers make mistakes on either end of the spectrum with setting their rates. The ones who've had a job, maybe leave that job and go, well, okay, I was getting paid $25 an hour at work. So therefore my freelance rate is $25 an hour because I don't know where else to start. And that seems good enough. And then I see some people who say, oh, well, I heard about so-and-so charging $500 per blog article or a hundred dollars an hour. And they maybe don't have the experience or the credibility or the clips and work samples to be there yet. When you're just getting your first couple freelance clients, how do you set your rates so you avoid being on either end of that spectrum? There are a couple of ways to do it. One formula is to take your best paying full-time job, add in the value of all, if you've ever had one, of course, (laughs) and add in the value of all of your benefits, come up with a total amount that you're worth per year, Mm -hmm. divide that by around 1900, which technically represents the number of work hours in a year Mm -hmm. and use that as a starting point for an hourly rate. Mm -hmm. You can also go to professional organizations. The Editorial Freelancers Association has a very popular chart of common rates based Mm -hmm. on a membership survey that a lot of people rely on as a starting point. There are other organizations in various aspects of writing, editing, graphics, photography, et cetera, that can provide either that kind of a chart or just input from colleagues about what they charge. And you can kind of mm-hmm. pick and choose among those kinds of resources. And you can also sometimes just put will work. I'm, I'm not a big fan of inflating one's value when you don't have a lot to show Mm -hmm. to prove that value. Right. But if you've actually gotten a lot of work done that you can, again, use to prove that you're worth hiring, then I'd say go high and just be willing to negotiate in those situations where somebody doesn't say, um, here's what we pay, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do is research Mm -hmm. writer's market, usually does, I don't know if they're still doing it. I should have checked. Writer's Market has resources for what various publications pay, mostly obviously for writing work. And you can look for, you can look at what some of these websites like an Upwork or a Readsy or a Fiverr, Mm -hmm. what they pay, and then go up from there. Mm -hmm. So you you can use this wide net of resources, starting with what you've been paid the most or the best for any full-time work that you've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really helpful to do some of that research and not get in your head about it. You can only make a mistake if you quote someone on a massive project. So if someone asks you to quote ghostwriting a book or a 12 month retainer, which is very, very unlikely as a new freelancer, then yes, you could undersell yourself and kick yourself later by saying, Oh, I didn't realize, you know, I, I said $30 an hour and I'm realizing that's way less than what I should have been paid. But I like advocating for those smaller test jobs to get started with, because you can see if it's a fit, you can charge a reasonable rate that you came up with at the time. And then at the end of the project, go back and say, was that fair? Do I need to adjust that? Have I learned anything new or has anything else changed in my business that should prompt me to alter that rate or the way I do projects? So, And that, I, I yeah. would warn people about two things. One is if you're doing something like ghostwriting or a level of editing that includes you doing some of the writing, or if you're doing editing and proofreading work, I'd be very, very careful about flat rates or project rates, because Mm -hmm. it is very easy to underestimate the amount of time and effort certain projects are going to take. Yeah. So I would start out with charging by the word or by the hour and then use that as a learning curve. The other thing I would be very leery about is if you hear from somebody who wants to either profit share or 
pay you from their royalties once mm. their blockbuster novel yeah. hits the bestseller charts. And my response to that, even now, is I don't share that kind of risk. I'm flattered, but I'd rather be paid for yeah. what I do. If your book gets published and it's a blockbuster and you make a fortune, you can send me a bonus. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't wait for somebody's sales and royalties to come in for me to get paid. If yeah. somebody kicks about that and doesn't want to pay you for the work when you do the work, then you move on and find somebody else. Mm -hmm. I could not agree more with that. The same for the clients who are offering you exposure or they're saying, yes. well, the, sam yes. <laughs> the sample work is I'm going to pay you $10, but there's the possibility of future work. No, we can't pay our rent or our utility bill with the possibility or exposure. Yeah. So I'm going to need money and, to pay me for that for now. And well, you know, and we you know, <laughs> exposure can get you arrested. Exposure can get killed. <laughs> exactly. you know? It's not, it's not ever, I mean, rarely too. The funny thing is usually the people who are offering you this quote unquote, great exposure, they don't have an audience. It's the, right. it's, it's right. not, it's not like it's somebody who's coming to you and saying, well, I do have 10,000 followers and many people will be seeing your work. It's usually not. It's somebody who, again, like you were talking about, they have this perception in their head that their project is going to be the blockbuster. It's really going to take off. And we can't, we can't take on that kind of risk. So it's, yeah. it's clear that there's some, you know, there's some entrepreneurial spirit here too, which can also help encourage you to go freelance. You do have to advocate for yourself. You have to negotiate your rates. You also have to do some client management. Are there aspects of client management that you think catch new freelancers off guard? Because it's not really something we learn the skills for oh, sure. unless yeah. you've worked in an agency before or something like that. Or, or even just in a standard in-house yeah. writing or editing job. But yeah, a couple of the things in terms of client management. One is you need to learn how to say no, mm -hmm. whether it's to somebody who doesn't want to pay what you're worth or it's somebody who wants to take up all your time and all your energy for very little in return. Mm -hmm. You also need to learn first of all, to manage your time. So you have to have a sense of how long it might take to work on an average project. Mm -hmm. And then you have to set your, your time frames, your acceptance of work, the amount that you accept, mm -hmm. the deadlines involved and so forth. That's under your control. Somebody might say they need such and such back yesterday. That doesn't mean you have to jump and kill yourself to get it done by some ridiculous, difficult, maybe impossible deadline. You have to learn to say, no, that won't work, but I can get this to you a week from Tuesday, channely wimpy here. <laughs> and, um, and you have to learn to say, this looks great, but it will take this much time rather than that much time. You also have to learn to tell people and stick to this when you are and aren't available, because depending on the type of freelance work you're doing, you might have people who want to call and spend hours on the phone or simply who want to call you at 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. at midday on a Sunday, whatever, on a holiday. I had one client a few years ago who wanted to spend time on something minor and silly and not necessary on the anniversary of my dad's death. And I had mm -hmm. said I was not available for that reason. And they called something like six times in one day because to them, all that mattered was what they wanted to do, not what I was interested in doing or, or available for on a given day. So yeah, we have to manage a lot of expectations and demands. We have to learn how to stand up for ourselves we have to learn how to set some limits. You can say, even on a website, hours are nine to five, mm -hmm. Monday through Friday. We might work at three o'clock in the morning. We might work over a weekend or on a holiday, but we don't have to tell people that mm -hmm. we will do that. We may do it to make sure the work gets done on deadline and as promised, but that doesn't mean people have to know that's how we're using our free, our so-called free time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing with managing clients is 
we need to also learn about contracts. They don't have to be super complicated, but it's important to have something formal with a client, especially the first couple go arounds with someone so that you're not taken advantage of, so Mm -hmm. that you don't do 17 revisions of a 500 word article, Mm -hmm. all for the original price, so that you don't have to do three times the amount of work that you expected because you didn't nail down the details. Mm -hmm. So some of that's on us. We have Mm -hmm. to remember to make sure to get as much information about a project as possible and then learn to stand up for ourselves and to say, oh, wait, this wasn't in the original agreement. I can do it, but it's going to add some dollars to the assignment. Do you want me to keep going or shall we stop where we are? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Yeah. And that can be hard to do, especially if you're just not used to that entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. and being independent. Yeah. The sooner you can advocate for your boundaries and what you want your projects to look like, the better. Um, I will say like most clients are not out to steamroll you. Some of them that do it, they don't realize they're doing that. They're used to working with employees or they built a certain work culture that for whatever reason supports that. But you do have to really hone that as a skill. And I think it doesn't come automatically for new freelancers because I remember, especially when you get started and if it's a side hustle, you're so grateful for every client who even gives you a chance. You're just like, yes, sure. I can do it. Oh, it was due yesterday. Don't worry. I'll cram it in today. You know? So we don't want to do that on an ongoing basis. And you really have to start to learn what works for you and what doesn't, you know, what kind of clients do you want to work with and where are those boundaries set down so that you can protect yourself from the clients who do attempt to sort of steamroll you with their management style, whatever that might be. So we've talked... Yeah, go ahead. And, and a lot of it, just quickly, a lot of that, it's not necessarily that somebody is trying to take advantage or trying mm-hmm. to be unpleasant or whatever. It may be that they're not used to managing a freelancer relationship Yeah, or they yeah. simply don't know what a given project involves. So again, we sometimes have to manage or educate our clients in the realities of what they're asking us to do. Mm-hmm. And that can be a little difficult But it's essential because otherwise you do get underpaid and overworked and extremely stressed and it's no longer fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that comes up a lot for new freelancers, especially if you don't ask your client before you start working together. Well, what is your experience working with other freelancers? You may have to teach them. They, They might not have worked with other freelancers effectively. They might not have worked with other freelancers at all. And so you want to start to sort of say, well, this is how I think we could really work together effectively. And as you get some experience, I like to flip that and say, this is what I've seen work with work the best with the clients I have. This is what gets success. We do a kickoff call. We get all the questions answered up front. We limit it to two rounds of revision, right? So we're not overthinking it and and dragging the project out too long. Then it becomes about your positioning yourself to help them get this project done efficiently and effectively rather than saying, hey, it's my way or the highway. So it's okay to kind of start implementing those things early on. If something causes you to raise a red flag or feels weird, trust that, right? Most clients are trust not your out, gut. Most clients are not out there to get you, but there are some, right? And so if someone says, "Oh, here's this huge project. I'll pay you all at the end and I'm not willing to sign a contract." Like, yes, you should be feeling the red flags at that moment because you are probably never getting paid. That client may not even exist, right? So, be careful and protect yourself. So, we've talked a little about the reasons to go freelance and how to set yourself up. What are some reasons not to go freelance? Maybe some things that attract people to this world, but then they're sort of caught by surprise of, oh, I didn't realize I was going to have to X. Well, the first one, of course, is you, once you're freelancing, everything you need to get your work done comes out of your pocket. Mm. And yes, most of it is tax deductible, but you have to obtain it or do it or, use it or whatever, pay for it Mm -hmm. before you can deduct something in your taxes. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to have some kind of a savings cushion because number one, you have to pay for your memberships, your supplies, your tools, your apps and programs, all of that. But also because for most of us, 
a freelance business doesn't become profitable on day one. Mm -hmm. It takes anywhere from a couple of months to, for some people, a year or two before they actually make enough money to live on. Yeah. And some people never do. Mm -hmm. Some people get lucky right away if you can convert an existing job into a freelance or contract gig, then you've got a much greater chance of surviving and profiting early rather than late. But not everybody can do that. So that's the first thing you need to have some, you need to have a financial cushion and you need to understand that from now on, everything relating to your work is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Those are two biggies for people. Mm -hmm. The other is, um, and I'm keeping in mind that I'm a major extrovert. I love belonging to groups. I love interacting with people. And as you probably know from our connection through the conference that I host, mm -hmm. I like doing things with colleagues and mm -hmm. interacting with people. So one of the things that a lot of people don't do enough is join and be visible in professional associations. There are associations for everything, whether it's a hobby or a business venture, whatever, a type of skill, anything you can conceive of that might relate to your freelance effort. There's an organization for that. There's an app for that. There's an organization for that. Mm -hmm. And people join professional groups and then sit there and wait for the organization to make them successful. Yes. So on the one hand, it's extremely helpful and, and even important to belong to at least one reputable major professional association. On the other hand, once you join, those only really help you if you participate, if you're visible, if you're in the discussion list or the conversation forum, if you go to events, if you offer to do stuff, you know, join a committee, be an officer, whatever, because the more people see of you, the better they understand who you are and what you do, how well you do it, and whether you're somebody they might recommend or refer or work with on their projects. Yes. I, had, I just got a new editing project this very week, literally yesterday, because somebody on one of my professional discussion lists, email lists, recommended me mm -hmm. based on interacting in an email list, not mm -hmm. necessarily meeting each other or working together, but having these conversations about the kinds of work that we do and the resources we use and, and our opinions on do it this way versus that way. You just never know where those things will come in handy. You learn from them, but you build up a network. So the yeah. networking factor is extremely important. What I would say are reasons not to freelance would be you don't have that entrepreneurial spirit. You're not prepared to or capable of going out and finding clients, dealing with ups and downs financially and so forth. If you are super shy or introverted, it's going to be difficult to, again, find clients and interact with them. It's also going to be a little hard to make the most of professional groups because, again, they're the most useful when you show up and people get to know you. And I guess the other a couple other things would be um, if you need a lot of money right away, yeah. you cannot assume <laughs> that will happen. Yeah. Again, sometimes it does. Your first project might be amazingly profitable, but it's unlikely. Yeah. If you... Also, if you have limitations on mm -hmm. how much you can get done, yes. once you're established, you can usually do less work for more money, mm -hmm. but it takes time to get established. Yes. If you don't have that patience, that's a red flag. Yeah. If you're gullible, because there are people who prey on freelancers and have very sophisticated scams. That's another reason to belong to professional groups is to learn about and avoid some of these scams that are targeting freelancers. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the only other one would be if you, if you have nothing to offer, if you have no training, no experience, no clips, that is copies of published work, 
no previous clients. Mm -hmm. You need something, and I mentioned this earlier, but you need something that will prove to a prospective client that you are worth hiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need something to, to prove that, yeah, I can do this. I've done something similar. Yeah. And here's here's the proof. Here's a here's a compliment from a previous client. Here's my published article. Right. Whatever yeah. it takes to show that, yeah, you have some skills, you have some chops to bring to the game. Yes. If I you don't have any of that, but you think that you would eventually like to freelance, then now is the time to start. Yeah. Doing something to create even a nominal portfolio. That's that's exactly what I was going to say next, because a lot of new freelancers say, OK, well, this is a chicken or egg scenario. I can't get experience because I don't have experience. So I can't I can't get my foot yeah. in the door for that first job. There are lots of ways around that. I think you mentioned a really good one, networking in professional organizations. I've also done things before, like if you have an idea for a small project that would get you experience, find a nonprofit whose cause you support and ask if there's a project you can contribute to. Yes. This is the only yeah. exception I would make to working for exposure or unpaid work. But let's say you really care about animal rescue and there's an animal rescue in your area that really needs its SEO on its page updated or could really benefit from a handful of graphics on their donation page. Those are good ways to get experience and kind of like donate your services in kind right. as well. So that's an option. I think um, you can also look for other freelancers who are established who may have overflow work or may need your support on a project. You could kind of learn. Um, but again, you're not going to be able to do that if you're not building a network. And then, of course, you can also create what I call fake samples, which is go through the process as if you were doing something for a company that you admire, creating some type of an output. I've seen virtual assistants create Trello boards of what a podcast workflow could look like. I've seen people create sample graphics, sample articles. They use their own website to promote their web design services and say, sure, right. here's my portfolio. I design it myself. So there are ways around that, but I could not agree with you more. Even if you come in and you have great sales technique and you feel really confident you can do the job, the client doesn't know who you are. And so you need right. something to say, here's my experience. Here's why I feel confident I can do this. I think I'd, the only thing I'd add to your list is I think the marketing aspect catches a lot of people off guard. Um, I've seen this where someone kind of expects that clients are going to fall from the sky and land into their lap and magically they will be booked and that most of us are hustling and we don't have to as much when we've been in business for a while. Don't get me wrong. We can rely on our network and referrals and retainers and all the lovely things. No, I, I think that's, that's a big point. And that, that's, that ties into the idea of join an association, but be visible in it. And mm -hmm. the also, also the idea that it takes time to build up a business. Yeah. What, what I've seen over many years now is a lot of people have good skills, maybe even have some experience and something you know in the way of a portfolio, projects to use to say, yeah, I've done this kind of thing and here's why you should hire me. Mm -hmm. But being a freelancer is work because nobody or very few people, especially when you're starting out, are going to just fall into your lap with projects. You yeah. have to go out and find them. You have to market yourself. You have to market your skills and your work. If you don't have a lot of material to prove that you can do what you say you do, then mm -hmm. you do need to maybe do a little free stuff for a cause you believe in mm -hmm. or a friend or whatever, something to, to create that portfolio. But you... Even when you're even when you're established, you're still going to have to go out there and find yeah. new work. Mm -hmm. If you've got one major big client with repeated assignments, maybe it's a monthly magazine, maybe it's somebody's ongoing website, whatever. Even when you've got that locked in, you can't assume it's going to last forever. Stuff happens. Companies go out of business. Organizations change their model. Editors decide to hire in-house people rather than rely on freelancers. Anything like that. You can have a 10-year relationship with a client, and tomorrow they're no longer there. So mm -hmm. you not only have to be constantly 
getting yourself out there to be found to get work, but you can't get complacent about existing work. And that's a huge piece of it. Yeah. There's another podcast episode coming out with one of my coaching clients that will be either before or after this one we're recording now, where we talk about she she got complacent with one really large anchor client and the company went under overnight and it just rocked her business. It took her months to bounce back. And so you do, you always want to be delivering great quality and service to your clients, but you're you're all, they're also not guaranteeing you a job for life. Even if they said, oh, this is an ongoing retainer or let's sign a year-long contract. All kinds of things can happen within a business. And so being adaptable and flexible is part of that freelance life too. Not just the flexibility in terms of how you set up your schedule and your workload, but you have to be able to pivot when your client tells you, we can't work together anymore, or I need to change our relationship, or my business is going in a new direction. Can you help me with that? Yeah. It could even be something as basic as, let's say you've been contributing a monthly article or column to a magazine for the past year or two. Your editor could go to someplace new and whoever replaces them might have their own pet freelancer Mm -hmm. and your editor's new place might not use freelancers. So that can, my husband worked for Bethlehem Steel. Bethlehem Steel went out of business in its 100th year, Mm -hmm. 100 years in business and gone the next day. So you, you can't assume anything. So one of the ways to think of that is I've got, plenty of work. I'm busy. I'm making money if we're lucky, but that could change. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes to me with a new project, I can either look at what I'm doing now and say, oh yeah, I can take that. I can start on it tomorrow, next week, whatever, or thank you for thinking of me. I'm really booked at the moment, but if it can wait for whatever time frame is appropriate, I would love to do this with you. If not, let me recommend, and this is another reason to get involved with call, uh, with professional groups, let me recommend somebody who might be able to help in the meantime, mm-hmm. and then maybe we can come back and talk about your next project once I'm less booked. So you, you want to keep those doors open, even if you can't take on a new project because you are very immersed in what you're mm-hmm. trying to get done right now. You don't want to shut that channel off completely. And the other thing, too, is there are ways of letting people know what you do and when you're available that you want to keep active. And I'm very I wouldn't say I'm great at this because I I do get a lot of stuff. I'm I've been around long enough that stuff tends to come to me before I start scrambling to find something new. But you can be on social media, you can be in discussion lists, you can be visible in professional groups, you can have a blog and or a website. And those are all ways of overcoming some of the challenge of marketing your business in a more active way. Those are all things you can do that become habit so that you do have a combination of work you consciously go after like querying magazines with new article ideas and work that comes to you because of your efforts, Mm -hmm. because you're visible. Yeah. Being visible is such an important part of running a freelance business. And unfortunately, some of the aspects of running a business are maybe not the most exciting or sexy, right? But it's showing up every day and doing the work and giving a good experience to your clients and maintaining that network and doing simple things like meeting deadlines and showing up to calls prepared and turning in work that's been proofread. Like none of those things are the the fun, exciting stuff, but they're really important to our clients and how we keep our clients. Well, you've shared a wealth of knowledge in this episode. Where can people go to learn a little bit more about you? I have two websites you can go to. The first one is for my overall freelance business, and that is www.writerruth.com. And I will note that I am a writer first and foremost, but I also, one of the things I've learned that's a big factor in success for many of us is that I also do editing, proofreading, speaking, and so forth. 
So some of that diversity of service is important when one type of work is slow. There's usually some other Mm -hmm. type of project I can be doing. And the other is for a business I started a few years ago that hosts an annual conference Mm -hmm. called Be a Better Freelancer, Mm -hmm. which Laura spoke at this year on a virtual basis. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to do that again in person in 2022 in Baltimore in the fall. And the website for that is www.communication-central.com. Awesome. And I can't recommend the conference enough. I met some great people who attended this year. And even though we were virtual, everyone was really engaged, asked very thoughtful questions, was excellent with their follow-up. And so it's a really high caliber group to be a part of and connect with. So yeah, definitely check that out. Put that on your radar if you're looking for conferences to attend, or like we talked about in this episode, building your network, easy way to get your foot in the door with people who are already doing the thing and you can learn from them. And I can tell you, Laura, that um, not only did this event come out of that conference, but I know quite a few people over the years who have gotten work or at least recommendations, but actual work from people they've met at the Be A Better Freelancer conference. So that's my little pitch for that event. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. This was wonderful. I loved it. This is my first ever (laughs) podcast. So speaking of diversifying and increasing the scope of a freelance business, now I know a little bit about how this works and I might try doing a couple of my own. I love it. You did an excellent job. So onward and upward. (laughs) 